r slash ask reddit people of reddit what stupid rule at your work school backfired beautifully zero tolerance ended shortly after a bully got thrown through a window because if i'm getting suspended for defending myself i'm gonna make it worth my while mad respect to the kid who tossed their bully through a window that kind of thing happens more than you think when you bully the fat kid who is always carrying 40 more pounds than you don't be surprised when he picks your 40 pound ass up and throws you like a noodly shot put. Back in 2014 our HR made a rule people couldn't go to other buildings. We had three buildings within a block of each other. All three had shipping areas and the warehouse employees had to go to each building to work. We were told to stay at one building. I mentioned we ship out of all three who is going to do the work. The genius said oh it'll be taken care of. Next day $500,000 shipment didn't go out. The following day we have a meeting. Why didn't you ship this? Up uh, two days ago we were told to stay in our building and someone would take care of it. The rule was quickly changed. Okay, but why didn't they want people to go to other buildings? They were trying to keep departments segregated. The lady was a control freak. She didn't want anyone talking to anyone else. Required every employee to use electronic time clocks to punch in out for work including lunch. Punching in late or leaving early would cause your pay to be docked and getting a discipline letter. Multiple people wanted to sabotage the clocks. Cut the cords. ETC. But wiser heads prevailed. Everyone arrived several minutes early and left late. Every single day. To avoid getting into trouble. Unfortunately, this created an impeachable evidence of hours worked. The employer had to pay out thousands of dollars in overtime the first month. The clocks disappeared exactly 5 weeks after they were installed with no notification. I worked in a call center and we had a similar clock system. Except we were allowed to arrive 5 minutes early then get on the phones at their scheduled time. One girl figured out they would pay for those 5 minutes. She started clocking in earlier and earlier until she was arriving an hour early and sat around for an hour every day. 5 extra hours of overtime every week. For close to a year or more until she quit. With none one in management catching wind. One of the first jobs I had. As a trainee in a big corporation's office. My supervisor noticed I came in a few minutes late once and told me off for it. I did arrive at 9.03 or what. But a few more minutes and my computer was booted up and I started working. Same day. Close to 9.30. I saw several co-workers coming out of the kitchen with coffee still in their hands and chatting. Getting to their desks and just then booting their computers. Boss didn't say a word. So I took up joining my co-workers for a 30 min coffee break every single morning for the 2 or 3 months I continued to work there. Every shift, there's a quota we need to fulfill. And then, even if you do fulfill it, you have to keep working until your 8 hours are up. Cue everyone speeding for 4 hours, having a 3 hour lunch coffee break, then slowly moving their ass for an hour. No rule about us taking necessary breaks if we're still capable of reaching the quota. Now we're allowed to stop once we're done. Geez a 3 hour lunch break is one of the most amazing things I've heard. It gets really ducking boring. For about 3 months in my last job, I would have about 40 minutes work to do per 7. 5 hour shift. There's only so much time you can kill in an office building. I worked at Starbucks for like 5 plus years before and during undergrad and at one point our district manager thought it was a good idea to implement a just say yes policy. Where we literally weren't allowed to tell the customer no. Lasted for about 3 months and in that 3 months our unaccounted product and waste went up over 300% because when the post didn't have a way to punch in a customer request we had to just do it anyways. We also got complaints from stores in surrounding districts because they had angry customers who were requesting things that were against local food service code and told them that we did it for them at our store i knew exactly how that policy was going to play out and i just laughed every time management was freaking out about the problems it was causing give me all the money in the cash register and make me a free iced coffee yes when covid started our boss demanded that our entire team sit in on group zoom calls even if the topics on the agenda didn't have anything to do with their roles she felt it would build team unity. Productivity dropped. Negative Google reviews came in. Staff became more stressed. When she demanded answers on the next Zoom call one of my co-workers bluntly said well. I would reply to this woman's voicemail. But I'm stuck on this Zoom call. 
After a round of needless layoffs at my old company, one of the C-level people had us on a call asking why things weren't getting done. One of my co-workers said, um I think the person who would have done that particular job no longer works here. And that's the right way to deal with the bullshit of companies trying to cut jobs. Don't pick up the slack. Don't point out the gaps. Just keep doing the job you always do until catastrophic failure hits the company. We cover for our shitty companies all the time and that's why they treat us like shit. The bottom floor of my secondary school was a square that had corridor all the way around. After some incident where a kid got knocked over, they implemented a one-way system. Unfortunately, they were very strict on enforcing it. If you accidentally walked past your class, you couldn't just turn around. They seemed very proud of their new rule. Until everyone started showing up late for class because they had to do extra laps of the bottom floor. That's ridiculous. My daughter is experiencing this with covered one-way rules. They're only actually in school once or twice a week between snow and hybrid so none of them know where the hell they are going. And if they miss, they have to go around again. I am the one who lives closest to work. So if the building alarm goes off overnight, I'm first on the list to get the call from the alarm company. It used to be that if we had good reason to believe the alarm was not an actual break and we could tell them not to summon the police and ignore the alarm. Open bracket. I can access the building cameras from home. The most common alarm was the cleaning crew who were always messing up the disarming. Then a sister site ignored an alarm that turned out to be an actual break in. And the facilities director decided that no matter what, if there was an alarm we should have the alarm company summon the police, then go to the building, get the police all clear, and reset the alarm. This was a pain in the ass but rare enough and I lived literally 2 minutes away. Then we contracted for the alarm company to come in and replace all of our panels and sensors. It was a nightmare process that ultimately ended up taking months, and the whole time there were phantom alarms. Sometimes multiple times a night, each time I had to go out in the middle of the night, I'd prepare the required report, send it to the facilities director, and request to go back to the old process. Each time he said no, we couldn't afford to miss a potential real break-in. After about 3 weeks of this nonsense, I was due for some time off, I was going out of town, and the protocol for that was for me to ignore calls from the alarm company so they moved to the next person on the list, which happened to be the facilities director, in the 5 days I was off, I must have ignored at least 4 overnight calls that all would have gone to him next, then suddenly, nothing. When I got back I was informed that for the duration of the alarm update, we just weren't going to arm the building at all. So much for can't afford to risk a break in. A long while back, but my school banned the color pink because a bunch of students were wearing it one October and they thought it was a gang thing. It was for breast cancer awareness month. The rule didn't go well for them. My principal banned pink silicone bracelets. They were being sold in town to raise money for breast cancer. Six months later she had to have chemo to treat her breast cancer. It's not really funny, but it is kind of ironic. Edit. Yes she survived. I still see her around town on occasion. Full remission. Back to better health than before. The gang hysteria seems to be a repeat offender in this thread. I've heard of tattoos and things being associated with gangs back in the day, but the only time I can recall a gang wearing color-coded uniforms is in the movie Grease. My spouse's workplace realized they didn't have a policy about sending sexual images or jokes as part of their email acceptable use policy, so they added it, except they made it a firing offense to send or receive sexual content. I think the intent was to stop people from subscribing to such content. They also said that your access would be immediately revoked until a determination was made. So someone got fired for something else and decided to send their whole management chain a graphically sexual image then reported using the anonymous tip line. IT got the report, concluded they did indeed receive sexual content, and did as required, suspended all the involved email accounts, including the SVPs. The policy has since been reworded. There's burning bridges and then there's drying up the lake just to fill it with gasoline. Damn. I'd assume that if you get fired, they're not exactly going to give you a glowing recommendation. Edit. I must admit I hadn't thought of the possibility of lawsuits. I'm from a country far less litigious than the USA. I'm not saying you couldn't sue for defamation where I am. It just hadn't crossed my mind. 
a place I used to work had a rule that executive level staff needed to be contactable when on leave. So they had a section on the leave form for the address of where you'd be staying and a contact number. Some knuckle shuffler in HR decided it applied to all staff and the shenanigans began. People would put down the address and phone number of sex shops, sports grounds, medical clinics. I gave the latitude and longitude of the place I was going camping and the UHF frequency channel my radio would be tuned to. My company used to be a small startup. In my first year I was the project manager and architect for a global system rollout. I put in my vacation days for Burning Man 6 months out, in February, and my PTO was approved. Then a few months later, June, my boss, who had been head of the IT department, got a new boss. New head of IT. With a month to go until Burning Man the new head of IT told me that my project rollout was too important for me to be uncontactable at all and that I would need to take a satellite phone to Burning Man or my vacation would be cancelled. We were still 3 months from goal live but he decided that we were at a critical moment that I had to be available for. However, neither my boss or the new head of IT wanted to carry out the daily $18 minute satellite phone calls with me. Probably because they knew it was violating some labor law. So they got one of the guys in the London office to call me in the Black Rock Desert each day. I said I wouldn't take the calls before 1pm. Which was 9pm for our man in London. Every day he called he had had a few beers. And didn't give a shit about project updates. He just wanted to know what parties I'd been to and what art I'd seen. I once had a manager tell us we couldn't hang out with each other outside of work unless we invited everyone. Uh no edit. Her name was not Michael Scott. Late 80s high school rule was no shorts. Classmate came for an exam with basketball shorts on that were below her knees. Teacher made her go home to change. She came back in a micro mini skirt and wrote her exam. My high school principal was known for sending girls home to change if their bra straps were showing. In my sophomore year he tried to send one of my classmates home, but she was like, nah, I've got a change of clothes, no need to send me home. So she went to the bathroom, took her bra off, and made a show of putting it in her locker. The principal was pissed, but couldn't do anything about it since she technically was following the dress code. It became a thing, like, hundreds of high school girls removing their bra at school or just showing up braless as a big duck you to the principal. As a woman, that rule made me feel incredibly self-conscious about being a girl, like bra straps, oh no, good on the students for balking at it. Couldn't buy drinks at lunch with cash money, had to buy some voucher, they were just cheaply made laminated pieces of paper, this was 2001, I was 13 and bored, scanned the vouchers and printed them out on paper that kinda matched the color of the vouchers, and laminated them myself. They were horrible made and not even the right color on the backside. Also crudely cut out. I made about a hundred of them of passed them out after I tried paying with them for myself and encountered no problems. Made some new friends and upped production. Took them about 3 weeks to find out but by then the fakes ones had intermingled with the real ones and had already been resold to students via the student office. About half of the vouchers sold were fakes. Drinks were cash only from then on. They had no choice to accept the fakes one for a little while longer though, as they had sold and charged for some of them. LOL. Did this with the old Seattle bus passes before they switched to the swipeable kind. The year long passes could cost as much as $300 or, you know, $1.00 at the local kinkers to print off an entire page of them. I had a friend who just kept all of hers. Eventually they'd reuse the letter and color and she'd just use an old one edit. Kept her Seattle bus passes I mean. Letter instead of number. To make moving between classes more efficient. They had designated up and down stairways. But they didn't take into account that the stairs were located at the ends of the very long corridors. Which meant it was impossible to get to your next class on time. Because of this. No one bothered trying to get to class on time and just blamed the stairway rule. Should have taken their cues from wayside school. Everybody goes up on the left and down on the right. Or similarly, have two elevators. One that only goes up and one that only goes down. Not really a rule, but a change in policy. I used to work for a major beer distributor as a delivery driver. They decided to start using less glue in the packaging to save money. We're talking a few cents per package. 
As a result, breakage during distribution increased drastically causing them to eat a lot more damaged product. It caused such a large loss in profit that they quickly changed course. Edit, since everyone is making guesses about which company I worked for, it was Anheuser-Busch, but it seems this is a common trial period for many beverage distributors. Been there, some accountant at my oldest job though they were a genius switching our aircraft grease with automotive grease on rotating equipment that runs from 3000, okay, up to 50,000 revolutions per minute, not even close to okay, saved several hundred bucks per case that first month. Fused the shafts on 3040 turbo compressors the same month. Not to mention the hundreds of production units in storage that has to be disassembled and degrees then regressed and reassembled all while we were already doing record OT. Sounds like a decision an engineer or technician should make, not an accountant, or do I not understand what accountants do? Students used to smoke in the toilets, so headmaster decided to lock all male toilets except one. Five places in one. Now my school had around 700 students, out of which around 300 were male. Everyone realized that it became impossible to go to the toy cut quickly. Result? Some guys went in one and pissed defecated in all trash cans. A lot. No one found them. But all the other toilets opened up immediately at it. For clarification, this happened in Eastern Europe. My middle school in Canada closed all the boys toilets but one after a few delinquent kids started stringing up toilet paper everywhere and flushing paper towels to clog the toilets. They actually boarded up the doors of the closed restrooms. This persisted for a few months until some parents stormed in as a group one day and verbally dragged the principal's tits over some coals. The others reopened. But the principal made an announcement encouraging children not to use them if possible for the sake of the janitor. Ridiculous. I went to a strict catholic school with uniforms. The kids in 4th 8th grade had to wear belts until we got a new principal who made it mandatory for all the kids in the school to wear belts. Many bathroom accidents from kindergartners, first and second graders later, and complaints from parents. Of course, the principal rescinded her addition to the dress code. More recently, this principal was fired for embezzling money from the school. I bet she also owned the only belt store in town. You can't speak a foreign language at work unless you're a certified translator in that language. We had a guy in a customer service position that spoke Spanish as a second language. Yep, his regular Spanish speaking customers were confused as to why he could no longer speak to them in Spanish. Because they knew he was fluent. Eventually Jay explains to them, in English, that they made it against the rules for him to speak Spanish. They weren't happy about that. In medicine we have a similar rule, but it only applies to official updates and documents. Many people speak Spanish, but you need to have an official medical interpreter for consents and whatnot. It's a liability thing. In medicine it makes sense because having a limited medical proficiency means you could misinform the patient. Also, people who aren't fluent enough to pick up the nuances of a second language might not realize that the patient isn't actually understanding what's being said to them, even if they nod along. While a certified and trained interpreter is taught to watch for this, this makes sure that the patient understands the message being communicated to them rather than them just hearing medical gibberish in their language. It makes sense for very important conversations, as you stated. While the lawyers make it about liability, the interpreters understand it's about effective communication. No more swipe cards to get in the building. From now on, it's going to be fingerprint sensors. That was two weeks before COVID-19 happened. So stupid. Kids already had to remember to bring books, stationery, lunch money and because of the pandemic, a mask and hand sanitizer. Now they are expected to remember to bring their fingers too. Edit. Sorry. I'm an idiot. I realize now they only need to remember one finger. He'd packed all his money, his pens and his mask, his books full of queries and questions to ask. His ruler, his pencil was waiting below. He looked at his hands and he whispered, oh no. Back in the early zeros, my high school implemented a policy that you had to wear your red tag at all times. If you didn't have it on, you were sent home. So many students lost their red tag to go grab food or skip a class. We were the only graduating class to wear them all four years. The policy ended soon after. 
I worked at a language teaching center where the lessons are pre-planned by the curriculum and on weekdays we often only have 2-3 hours of classes sporadically spread out through the afternoon evening. The management were pretty chill when I started, and people just planned their lessons in bulk, which basically entailed checking your schedule and printing out the required unit session worksheets and just showed up 10 minutes before to deliver the lesson. On weekends we'd have full 10 hour work days. Apart from that we'd have the odd training session or faculty meeting but otherwise you could basically go home or go do whatever you wanted between lessons. All the provided apartments were within 10 minutes walking distance of the center so this was pretty ideal. The nice managers left, and the new management were a-holes have started scheduling mandatory office hours where we had to be in the center with absolutely nothing to do. There'd be a 12 o'clock staff meeting and my next lesson would be at 4 6 pm, and then 3 and a half bullshit office hours in the middle. When we asked them what we should do they said think about your teaching methods. Basically bullshit dong -wiving. A bunch of the other teachers starting watching movies on the projectors in the spare classrooms. I brought in my switch. Some people would just straight up go nap on the beanbags in the reading nook. The thing was there was literally no busy work they could generate and soon it was apparent to everyone. Especially prospective new students and parents. How unprofessional and awful it made the center look. The managers embarrassingly just stopped scheduling and enforcing these office hours. Go find something to do. The battle cry of the useless shitty manager. If you have time to lean. Back in 2011, a company I worked for had the bright idea to block all social networks because, you know, employees should work instead of slacking off on Facebook. I could write volumes of books on the toxic culture in that place. But the owner slash president who lived in a different country and visited about once every few months was universally feared by everyone and a few days before his arrival the whole building went into panic mode. So a few weeks after the social network ban, his royal highness shows up, and five minutes later half of IT department is scrambling to his office. Apparently there was an issue with the Wi-Fi, or at least that's what he figured since he couldn't log on to Facebook. It was fixed in seconds. A few years and three promotions emotions later, I make a joke about it with him, instead of a laugh, I get a confused look, turns out he still thinks it was some internet problem since whoever decided to ban social networks didn't have the balls to tell him about it after the incident. Facebook, Twitter and LinkedIn were all blocked by IT at my company a few months ago after some other massive IT issues, now it makes it really hard for my department, marketing, to do anything. My boss has to fire up the hotspot on his phone and do things with his laptop if we want anything posted to social media. Edit. I should have noted that my boss's phone and laptop are paid for by the company, but we also have a marketing coordinator who works remotely that does the bulk of social media postings. In our company we have our exceptions filter for our marketing people to let them access this stuff. Surprise you guys don't have this. I was working as a medical assistant at a private practice medical clinic. Our clinic manager wouldn't allow the new receptionist to drive to the bank to deposit cash. Made her walk carrying the money bag so that she couldn't drive away with the money. Bizarre. I know. That went on for a few weeks. Then the receptionist was mugged and over $1000 in cash was stolen. She was allowed to drive after that. Instead of having the risk of one person stealing the cash, who worked for them and who they had all her personal identifying information, they made the uh, risk anyone out and about who may steal. Basic risk avoidance or reduction logic would have been good to use when they were thinking that one up. Edit I've never seen so many upvotes before. Very cool. Thanks reddit. Colon. Also, I fixed the typo in identifying as it was killing me. People who were caught wandering the halls or skipping classes were sent straight home. Similarly, when I was in high school, I once got suspended for ditching school too many days in a row. Whoa, you made it to the end? You're a ducking beast. I'll cut you a deal. Smash like and subscribe for more curated content bruh. It's free and that's a great price.